hello everyone welcome thank you for joining in just one minute i'm gonna um, hand it over to our moderator dr rebecca shirley to kick us off and start the session welcome everyone thank you all for joining us in our second dialogue on scaling locally led adaptation welcome back first of all to those of you who are with us for dialogue number one and a very hearty welcome to those of you joining us for the first time now my name, as Tamara said, is Rebecca Shirley, and I am the Director of Research, Data, and Innovation for Africa at the World Resources Institute. And I am thrilled to be here as your moderator for today's discussion. As I hail from the Caribbean, and the topics of solutions for adaptation to a changing climate, especially for islands, is very close to me personally. So it's great to be with such an esteemed group of experts from the LATAM community. So first, in just a minute, we will kick off our discussion with some opening remarks from a wonderful set of speakers. And then we'll have a short presentation from my colleagues on the different approaches for supporting locally led adaptation. And then we're going to break out into smaller groups for discussion. And after all of that, we'll wrap up with our learnings and our insights before we close. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. And we are honored today to have three incredible champions for climate and locally led adaptation with us. Before we kick off the discussion, each speaker will have five minutes to share their insights and experience with us. Our first speaker is Alicia Herbert, the Special Envoy for Gender at the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO, to provide opening remarks. Thank you for joining us, Alicia. The floor is yours. Uh, huge thanks uh, for, for that introduction, Rebecca. And, uh, it's it's an absolute pleasure to be part of uh, of this conversation today, and indeed for the speaking remarks. Not least because I am a product of the region. I was born and grew up in Trinidad and Tobago, and travelled very extensively throughout the region. So doing anything that involves Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, you know, is very very close to my heart. Um, so as I said, real pleasure to be speaking as part of this regional dialogue on locally led adaptation. Uh, in my role as a UK Special Envoy for Gender Equality and throughout my career in development, I have had the privilege of learning about the experiences of people and communities around the world who are at the forefront of climate change. Climate related disasters and increasingly unpredictable weather events are having a profound and often devastating impact on lives and livelihoods, ecosystems and economies. As we all know, there's a wealth of knowledge held by local communities, by women, by young people, by indigenous people, which is vital for successfully dealing with these impacts, combining tradition with innovation to build resilience. And this group heard a number of inspiring case studies as, as the first um, a series of, of regional workshops in September, focusing on successful examples of peer-to-peer -peer capacity building, devolved decision-making, support for indigenous-led action, and promotion of innovative uh, practices, just to name a few. We know that progress is already being made across the world. However, there is a limit to what can be achieved without the necessary enabling environment. And we, as an international community, must do more to help support and drive effective adaptation on the ground. And this is a critical aim of the UK's COP presidency. This requires amplifying the voices of those who are not often heard and making local communities agents of change. This requires change across all levels of society and across the development finance architecture. We must prioritize locally led adaptation in decision making and implementation so that marginalized people and communities are empowered to protect their own future and finance is available and accessible to those who need it most. We must learn from approaches like the LDC Initiative for Effective Adaptation and Resilience or LIFE AR program, of which the UK is a supporter. And that program recognizes that countries, local communities, organizations, and authorities are the experts in informing the decisions of how to prepare for climate change in their own context. Life AR is focused on supporting countries to develop tailored financial mechanisms to channel ultimately up to 70% of all climate funds to local levels. With Fiji and other partners, the UK presidency launched a task force on access to climate finance to align programmatic support behind national plans and to improve access to climate finance flows. The task force will develop a set of principles and recommendations to underpin and to guide a new approach to access, 
with climate finance providers and recipients encouraged to sign up by the time of COP26. The way in which we undertake research and use evidence must also change. For example, the Adaptation Research Alliance is seeking to catalyze a paradigm shift so that research responds to local needs, focuses on action and informs decision making. The Alliance will seek to strengthen collaboration between southern led local organizations and the global north to enhance capacity building. We encourage all of those engaged in building our collective knowledge base to endorse the Alliance's results oriented ad adaptation research principles. In making locally-led adaptation a central priority of COP26, we not only want to amplify the calls for greater support for locally-led action, but also to address the barriers that restrict and prevent finance flowing to local level. COP26 in November, just a few weeks away, provides an ideal opportunity, a key opportunity, to amplify the importance of locally-led adaptation, to share lessons about progress already made, and to bring together donors, SIDS and LDCs on this agenda. We must ensure momentum is continued into the African COP27 presidency and well beyond that. I look forward to continuing to work together to champion this crucial agenda. Thank you very much. Cheers. Alicia, thank you so much for those comments. Wonderful to hear, first of all, from a Trini sister. That's wonderful. And uh, great to see all of the many places that people are joining in from on the chat. That was really excellent to hear about Life AR, the Alliance, and the efforts ongoing at FCDO to support locally-led adaptation. And that, that puts us in the perfect place for the rest of our conversation today. So thank you so much for that. Our next speaker is Crispin Dorvin the Program Director for Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management at the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States Commission, the OECS. Crispin, thank you so much for joining us to share your brief reflections. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and um, thank you for the, for the opportunity and good day, everyone. The latest IPCC report paints a very somber picture for the region. A very somber climate future indeed. Intensifying droughts and hurricanes, sea level rise, rising temperatures, and decreasing precipitation are just some of the negative impacts of climate change that will manifest themselves in the region. To quote a popular song by the ever popular Bob Marley, who feels it knows it. Where climate impacts are concerned, the people who feel it most directly are often those who live in small communities and who subsist on the products and services of proximate ecosystems. In other words, impacts are often localized and therefore require a local solution. In the OECS, we have recognized this reality. And for this reason, many of our adaptation interventions are community-based and, and involve local actors in the lead wherever possible. Such interventions focus on, among others, mangrove restoration and maintenance, construction of climate resilient community structures, drainage and sustainable fisheries. In May of this year, the 8th Council, OECS Council of Ministers Environmental Sustainability adopted a Regional Climate Change Adaptation Strategy and Action Plan, CICASAP. Embedded in this CICASAP is a recognition of the importance of acting locally with respect to adaptation, even while thinking nationally, regionally and globally. Fundamental to effective local lead adaptation is the recognition of the value of ecosystem-based approaches, which incorporate natural processes as part of the solution. Equally critical is the need for ensuring gender equality and social inclusion. In recognition of this reality, the OECS in 2020 released a toolkit that seeks to explain how people and communities in the Eastern Caribbean can mainstream ecosystem-based adaptation, gender equality, and social inclusion. The toolkit, the toolkit also included associated case studies. Further, the OECS is hoping to issue a call in the near future to member states for the submission of small eco-resilience projects to support local adaptation action. Forums such as today's dialogue are essential to sharing experiences, empowering actors, and in general, building momentum for locally driven adaptation. Notwithstanding the local focus, there remains a role for actors local, national, regional, and international, government, civil society, private sector, and intergovernmental. 
It is good that many are represented today, and we look forward to an outcome, to outcome, sorry, that will advance the regional adaptation agenda. We also look forward to further collaboration in the interest of building resilience in our region. With these brief words, I say thank you and all the best for today. Thank you, Crispin. Wonderful to hear about the toolkit and the resources that are now available through OECS. It's really excellent. Wonderful. And now we'll move on to our third speaker. Um, our next speaker is Anne-Sophie Cherisola, the Director of the Climate Action Team at the United Nations. Anne-Sophie, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the uh, invitation. It's really a pleasure to join you here at this second regional dialogue. Um, I speak to you from uh, the UN headquarters uh, in New York. And uh, from my office on the 31st floor, I see the uh, East River and the many buildings under construction on the Brooklyn side of the river. These buildings will have a fabulous view on Manhattan and none of them will have flooding insurance, uh, even if we know that these properties will be in fact flooded in a few years if nothing changed. Um, I'll be honest with you, uh, this is the extent on my, of my locally led adaptation experience. Um, my job uh, right now is to help lead uh, the UNSG climate team at a global level and to mobilize all leaders, and that includes all of you, on getting a few things done globally to make sure that your work at the local level uh, is effective. I'm not going to repeat what previous colleagues have said. Yes, we are in a dire situation, and yes, the region uh, has been hit. You don't need me to explain that to you. Uh, the latest IPCC report revealed that the situation will worsen at 1.5 uh, degrees. We are currently mm -hmm. around 1.1 and 1.2, and quite frankly, all of us, and again, even here in New York, uh, we see the impacts. What is it that needs to be done at a global level to ensure, again, that the work at the local level uh, is effective? First, you all know that, close the emission gaps, uh, which means that national pledges must collectively put us on track, reduce emissions by half by 2030 compared to 2010 levels. We are very far uh, from here. And in fact, the Secretary General is now telling countries that they probably need to update on a regular basis without waiting for five years or 10 years, their uh, nationally determined contributions and probably their national adaptation plans as well, as often as possible until we get on track. Number two, and this is something uh, really that the Secretary General has taken to heart and that uh, my own boss, Selwyn Hart, that you know, I'm sure he's from your region, has been really pushing hard. Uh, we need to fix uh, the adaptation finance gap, and that includes quantity and quality. All the people like yourself already on the front lines of this climate crisis, you do have uh, the first-hand knowledge of the impacts. You are the best place to identify solutions. Maybe many of you or your colleagues are tackling the crisis. You're taking creative and impactful action to prepare for, but uh, you or your colleagues often have to use their own resource. And you are also very the key decision makers on finance, and this is wrong because we know that with the right resources, local communities are a huge and untapped resilience bridging resource. They can deliver more context specific, agile, and diverse approaches. This is why uh, we have been advocating and the Secretary General in particular in his public as well as in his private meetings has been asking the following. One uh, is asking all donors and that includes governments and multilateral development banks to allocate 50% at least of their climate finance to adaptation. And uh, since we've been asking for this, we've seen two kinds of reactions. Some donors telling us, oh, this is very hard, this is very complicated, we don't know exactly what adaptation projects are, more information. This is why 
uh, we need you and the many, many examples of adaptation projects you are working on to help us really push this goal. I must say that so far we've been a little disappointed, well, more than a little actually, by the lack of convincing response coming from MDBs and the World Bank in particular. We are a little surprised. I mean, the World Bank is used to uh, working with, with targets, uh, you know, on, on their portfolio. And we really hope, and again, I'm counting on you that with your help and the help of many others, uh, we'd be able to encourage uh, the World Bank and other donors to move closer toward this target. As you may or may not know, uh, we are currently, uh, adaptation finance is currently about 20-25% of all climate finance, which is just wrong. We have seen some countries uh, that have agreed uh, to do more, they have announced commitments of at least 50%, uh, and that's the Netherlands, that's Denmark, that's Sweden, and, and we more uh, to do that and quite frankly I'm, I'm counting on your help on that. What we see also that we think needs to be a lock again to allow for effective action at the local level is something that you all know about is the problems to access uh, finance and in particular adaptation finance. We see many countries and also local communities struggling uh, to access and utilize existing financial resources there are issues of eligibility, of red tape, of capacity building that must be resolved. Just this week, uh, during the meetings at the World Bank and the uh, IMF, uh, the Secretary General met with the numbers of uh, finance ministers uh, and other leaders, and he started asking them for the following. One, he asked finance ministers to instruct their representatives at OECD, to start work on the revision of eligibility thresholds for official development assistance to improve access to finance, in particular for low and middle income countries and for small island developing states. That's more or less uh, your region that would allow uh, access to more uh, finance. Uh, so we will continue uh, to push uh, for that. I consider all of you uh, friends uh, and leaders of this cause, and we'd be happy to follow up with you to see how we can continue to help uh, each other. And I really commend your work on these principles of locally led adaptation action. Again, it also helps us a lot to push uh, these issues uh, with other leaders and really to do what we all need to do, meaning connect uh, the global with the local uh, to make sure that we have uh, the right uh, instruments and that you have the right instruments to, uh, to do your work. So you can count on us. Uh, we stand committed to working with you to protect uh, the billions of people at risk. And I thank you very much for the invitation. And Sophie, thank you for those words on behalf of the UN. Thank you for that very enthusiastic show of confidence in local communities. Um, thank you for that charge to continue to push uh, for, for more financing, for, for stronger commitments from the MDBs. And I really appreciate that you emphasize not just the quantity, but the quality of the finance. Thank you for all of that. And thank you to all of our speakers. You've put us in a wonderful place to have this conversation. Now, we can see in the chat, folks are joining us from all over Latin America, from all over the Caribbean. It's a really wonderful group that we have here. This is very promising. So we'd like to do a quick exercise to get everyone warmed up for a great discussion ahead. This exercise, which I'm just learning about myself as well, is called a chat shower. So we have two questions. For each question, we'd like you to type a very short response into the chat, but don't hit send just yet. We'll wait a moment and all hit send at the same time and have a shower of insights, hence the phrase, a chat shower. So as you can see on the screen, uh, the first question is, what is the change that you would like to see to scale up locally led adaptation? And you can see all the various translations below. So please type your answers. Don't, don't hit send just yet. And they're coming through here. You can see participation of youth, women, finance commitments, governments taking a stronger lead, improved access to finance, engaging local communities, regulations. 
more involvement, more involvement, more involvement of local communities, involvement of CSOs, participatory governance, political will, really wonderful. Thank you for these responses. Political will coming up quite a bit. Community empowerment, youth empowerment, wonderful. Great. So uh, that shows that we're all quick with the fingers. This is excellent. So let's move on to our next question. The next question uh, is going to be, what is your biggest hope for locally led adaptation at COP26 in just now two weeks, two weeks and a bit? What is your biggest hope for LLA? What do you want to see happen for LLA at the COP? So again, I'll just pause for a few seconds so people can get their answers ready. Firm, and I mean firm commitments. I like that. Commitments, higher percentage. Immunity from middle agents. <laughs> Alternatives to extractivism. Autonomy, locally led communities being able to take on, make the agenda, evidence, real concrete practices. Financial commitments, less talk, more action. I think that sums it up. Wonderful. Thank you all for all these great thoughts. And we will revisit these questions in more detail in the breakouts and at the end. But before we break out into discussion, and I can see that we're all really fired up to do that, we want to share a quick recap of our first dialogue and the principles of locally led adaptation. And we're going to follow that up with a presentation on pathways for delivering and supporting locally led adaptation. So for this session, please feel free to add any questions or comments into the chat box during these presentations. We'll have a short bit of time for our, for our speakers to, to address those. Let me begin by introducing Eileen Marina Cunningham of CADPI, El Centro para la Autonomía y Desarrollo de los Pueblos Indígenas, the Center for the Autonomy and Development of Indigenous Peoples. Eileen, over to you. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you to all of you that are here today. It's really interesting all the answer that you are um, included in the chat. As Rebecca said, um, I'm going to, to do a, a very brief recap of the first dialogue. Um, as introduced, this dialogue is part of the Scaling Up Locally Led Adaptation Project of the locally led adaptation project in collaboration with the COP26 presidency, the Adaptation Action Coalition, and the Race to Resilience. This project aimed to support the impact of scaling up state and non-state locally led adaptation by developing pathways to replicate, scale up, and finance locally led adaptation via delivery mechanisms across Asia Pacific, Africa, and Latin American Caribbean. And as you already hear, this is the second round of the dialogue, and this is a specific for Latin America and the Caribbean. And the first round was in September, and we hear from 11 cases globally um, in the different region, cases that delivering climate finance behind local priorities and facilitating locally led adaptation. These create very inspiring ideas for locally led adaptation, collaboration, and initiative. Um, they clearly show that it's not longer good enough for the international community to hide behind statement, because we always hear that it's too hard to support locally led adaptation. But during this first round of dialogue, we show I just a glimpse of the opportunity to radically transform the way adaptation and climate action is supported. The second, the second round of dialogue provides the space for a more 
reach discussion and advance understanding about the pathways enables and champions. Everybody get one of the cards uh, and have this mic on. Okay, thank you. So the second round is to show the pathway, the enablers and changes to scaling up, replicate and collaborating across different locally led me delivery mechanisms and how international climate finance can better support this pathway, including what he asked at COP26 should be. After this round of dialogue, we look forward to practically advancing ideas for scaling up locally led adaptation including the, uh, the numerous events at COP26. So here we see all these 11 um, examples about locally led del uh, delivery mechanisms that were presented during the first dialogue. I'm not going to talk about all of this because you can also go to the, to the link in the, in the YouTube and see also not only the Latin American um, dialogue, but the dialogue from the other region. These 11 stories were examples or delivery mechanisms supporting locally led adaptation in Africa, Asia Pacific, and Latin America and Caribbean. And these are good practice at how this, how is delivering the eight principle of the locally led adaptation. There were just few examples um, but there are other, and you can see in the map, there are other uh, examples around the world. Um, uh, we have over 100 examples, and I imagine you have more examples that you can even share with us later. So for Latin America and the Caribbean, we have seen some examples um, like um, the Global Fund for Indigenous People, of the Pawanka Fund, that is a global indigenous people-led fund that finance indigenous people initiative via grant making directly to indigenous people organization. We also saw um, the civil society non granting via critical ecosystem partnership fund from the Caribbean, Canary, um, utilizing Canary a regional intermediary with local footprint. Um, and we also saw the example of the microfinance for resilience, Fundo Cooperación, that is a private foundation with strong public and private sector collaboration, seeking for support, financial inclusion, and sustainable in tourist and agriculture, supporting MSMEs and CBOs with tailored credit and advisory service. Um, as I said before, we encourage all of you to continue sharing other stories of delivery mechanisms that you have. And there we have a templates available. So if you want to share this information with us. So we see here the eight principles of locally led adaptation. This is just a quick reminder. Um, and the 11th case that we have at global, global level uh, provide great examples of how uh, of delivering against these eight principles. Um, this global movement has led to a principle which are intent to guide better locally led practice. And we can see here that some of these principles are devolving decision making to the lowest appropriate level, addressing structural inequities faced by women, youth, disabled, and excluded ethnic group providing patients and predictable funding that can be accessed more easily. Um, we also have um, invest in local capabilities to live an institutional legacy, building a robust understanding of climate risk and certainty through a combine of local traditional indigenous as well as scientific knowledge, flexible program and learning to address the uncertainty in adaptation, transparent financing and decision-making process that are accountable, don't work to local stakeholder, and also the collaboration across sector and level to ensure that different initiatives and different sources of funding support each other. So these are the eight principles and um, all these 11 examples are supported by these principles. And I, as I say before, I imagine there are going to be more examples around the globe. 
So these are some of the headlines that came from the first dialogue, some of the relevant ideas. Um, and I think there were more than this, but we just want to share some of, of this with you. And I think one of the most important is that um, Diane Black Lane from AOSIS is calling for a 1 billion fund for locally led adaptation action that is, I think is really important. And uh, she said that um, the, all those subsides that exist for fossil fuel could be directly, um, uh, could be directed to especially locally led adaptation through NGOs and civil society group. I hope um, we can see some changes. Also other, other ideas is like devolving decision-making should be strengthened in governance model. Voices from the ground need to be consistently include to keep response agile and responsive. Cohesion should, will be built over time. Also local people time needs to be acknowledged rather than presume they can participate for free opportunity cost of diverting action toward adaptation and local CSO often resource trapped. Also, it say that there is no way we can shift what is happening right now without locally led adaptation process. Um, locally led funded time horizon need to be longer. And I think that is very important for indigenous people in our case, because we, have, we always uh, advocate for that. We have a different timing frame. Also about community and local organization should bear the financial risk, but having to jump through onerous hoops designed for international organization. That is one of the main issues with uh, climate finance also. Uh, one of the main challenge for, for local organization. And business as usual approaches are not working in our countries, even at one degree Celsius warming. So, and I think this is very important about local and traditional and indigenous group provide trolls and network need to deliver effective locally led adaptation based, based on understanding the local political economy, possessing established network and understanding the surrounding natural environment. So I say these are just some of the ideas. It was really a very uh, rich and robust discussion during the first um, um, dialogue. So um, these are some of the questions that were arise during the first dialogue um, related to the eight principles also. Um, are intermediaries needed for support and locally led adaptation? Most funds are too large, large to go direct, directly to the local level. Therefore, we need sustainable or better intermediaries, more connected and accountable to local levels. Uh, by example, delivery mechanism concept. How are we going to define this delivery mechanism concept? I think it's also one of the issues that local organization and indigenous people will always uh, raise in their commitment, in their issues. And also how are excluded people actually involved and supporting decision making, especially people with disability? Um, how are local people and organizations supported to build resilience to longer term and more extreme climate change? So um, also it's important the, um, the role of the local private sector, for example, uh, microfinance, microinsurance, cooperative impact and community investment. And for, from this first dialogue, we showed to the world that we can deliver climate finance more directly to local communities on the front line of climate change. And we dramatically move away from this international intermediaries architecture. They are no more excuse to say there is a lack of capacity uh, or that there is too costly to get climate finance to the local level. So thank you, and Rebecca, I'm back to you. Gracias, Aileen, por este resumen del primer diálogo y los principios de la adaptación localmente. Thanks, Aileen, for that recap. We now have Ainka Grandison, the Senior Technical Officer at the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute, Canary, who will take us forward and present on the pathways to achieving locally led adaptation. 
which together with Eileen's presentation provide a base for the breakout group discussion that will follow. So Anka, over to you. Thanks for that. So greetings firstly from sunny Trinidad and Tobago. It's lovely to see such a great turnout today for the dialogue. Uh, to provide some context for our breakout discussion today, I have been asked to provide a brief overview of the different pathways for scaling up locally led adaptation or LLA for short. Um, these pathways have been identified based on the findings from the 11 different case studies of innovative financing and governance models presented at the first dialogue and the various other examples that we've identified which Eileen just did a very good recap of. Um, and this is recession is really meant to guide our reflections on what are the different pathways for delivering LLA? What are the enablers that facilitate this process? How can international climate finance better support these pathways? And what should be our ask at COP26 to really scale up impact and enable frontline communities to adapt and build their own resilience? So when we speak about pathways, what we're really speaking about are delivery mechanisms. These are the different means by which funding is channeled down to local levels to support community organizations, resource users, households, and other local actors. And these mechanisms exist because as Eileen mentioned, most climate funds are provided in large amounts that cannot really be accessed effectively by small local organizations and so various institutions, which may be government, civil society, or private sector, are used to deliver these funds to the local level. And one of the key findings from the case study is that we really need a shift towards use of regional, national, and subnational institutions, such as local banks, cooperatives, and local civil society organizations to deliver finance for LLA which are closer to the ground and more accountable in some ways to local actors, rather than some of the international institutions or intermediaries that currently dominate the finance landscape, like the UN agencies and multilateral development banks. These homegrown intermediaries are most effective where they're able to provide direct access to finance and amounts suitable to local actors, for example, via small grants or small and micro loans, and to help these actors manage these finances, where they're able to facilitate inclusive governance and ensure that the marginalized and most vulnerable groups have a voice in defining priority needs and strategies for adaptation and how funding is allocated, where they're able to take climate information that is often complex and shared with local actors in ways that they can easily understand and use it to inform adaptation, where they're able to learn and can shift gears rapidly to deal with changing risks on the ground, both at present and into the future, and crucially are embedded at the national or local levels so they can continue to provide support over the long term as adaptation can take decades, not just a few years, as we know. Now, in the first dialogue, we heard about the 11 innovative case studies, and there's also all these other examples that have been identified for delivering LLE via these regional, national, and subnational institutions. To give a few concrete examples to reflect on to, in terms of the different pathways or delivery mechanisms, uh, these included, for example, a global fund, which Eileen mentioned, um, which is the Kwanka Fund for Indigenous Peoples, um, where they actually provide granting directly to Indigenous Peoples organizations and use really innovative criteria such as cultural due diligence to guide grant making. Uh, there's also national funds such as Antigua and Barbuda's Sustainable Island Resource Framework Fund, Namibia's Environment Investment Fund, which provide grants and loans to a range of different um, entities from private households to enterprises to even local government entities and use financing from international climate funds, but also endowment funds and even environmental levies to support climate adaptation, mitigation, as well as natural resource management. 
Eileen already mentioned the example of a civil society on granting where the critical ecosystem partnership funds Caribbean program is using a regional intermediary canary to provide 10 years of grant making. Um, and this is focused on protecting critical ecosystems and building climate resilience in the Caribbean and draws on funds from a global consortium, including World Bank. There's also interesting examples of microfinance and lending where, for example, Funde Corporacion, a private foundation in Costa Rica, is supporting medium, small, and micro enterprises, as well as community-based organizations in the agriculture and tourism sectors, providing tailored credit advisory services to really promote resilience at the local level and financial inclusion. Um, and then finally, we have examples of even like very sort of grassroots level community resilience funds um, with an example, for example, from Indonesia, where the Yakum Emergency Unit um, provides grants to women's groups so that they can better engage in planning at the local government level, particularly around disaster risk reduction and building resilience in their own communities. And so when we look across these different case studies, we see a number of different sort of journeys which have led them to where they are and have supported their scale up, taking different amounts of time and focusing on building different types of capacities to effectively support LLA and working from small amounts of funding and eventually building up a track record where they're able to be recognized at national and even international levels and attract and leverage more mature and larger sources of funds from international climate funds like the Adaptation Fund, Green Climate Fund, World Bank, and other development banks. I think an interesting thing that was mentioned earlier by Eileen and should be highlighted again is that they're often supported by risk-taking donors, especially in the earlier stages, such as philanthropists or even small grant facilities like the Jeff Small Grant Program that are willing to maybe take on a bit more risk. They've also been supported by different enabling environments. So for example, um, decentralization of funding to district or community levels, legal commitments that mandate, for example, a certain percentage of funds go to local actors or national policies and budgets to specifically support local adaptation. And then if you really think about it across all these examples, we've been able to identify the following categories of mechanisms for delivering LLE that are useful for us to reflect on as we go into the breakout groups. And these have been, can be sort of categorized firstly into state government led mechanisms, private sector led mechanisms and civil society or grassroots mechanisms, as well as those that are based on partnerships among public, private or civil society. And so for the state or government led mechanisms, there are these national climate funds, which I already mentioned some examples from Antigua and Barbuda and Namibia. There's also local government climate funds, there's social protection schemes that may be using, for example, cash transfers to support the most vulnerable and poorest. There's also these different private sector led -like mechanisms for us to think about, which include microfinance institutions, cooperatives, co-ops, uh, local commercial banks, and then there's these civil society led mechanisms where, for example, you have the aggregating of local people's savings, for example, in urban poor funds, um, where poor households pull their monies to support each other, for example, in Zimbabwe, we have a nice example of that. And actually in the Caribbean is similar to what we might call SUSU or box hands. Um, that's also a means that you can pull funding. Um, there's also these community resilience funds and, of course, the civil society led grant making where national or regional NGOs serve as intermediaries for larger funds. So going to, into the first question for the breakout groups, um, we'd really like you to think about the different types of delivery mechanisms, state led, private sector led and civil society led. And what are the range of enablers that support these different types of mechanisms? and approaches to LLA. And these enablers could be a range of things, thinking about whether there's a strong and established lo local presence, um, whether there's strong local networks, whether there are policy or regulations in place, 
whether there's a focus on building local capabilities and what type of capabilities, whether they're sort of robust financing mechanisms and what are the key features of these and whether they're committed resources and even risk-taking donors that are willing to support the work. And then in terms of the second question we want to ask is how can international climate finance better support these LLA delivery mechanisms? You know, while these mechanisms have already been able to attract and leverage international climate finance successfully, there still exists a big gap in terms of what is needed on the ground and the type of support that's being provided in terms of both quantity and quality. And here we really want to reflect on on who could be these funders and the different rules ranging from philanthropists to bilateral and to multilateral funders. And here we can even think about the big three that have been seeking to set up mechanisms to enhance direct access to local actors like the Adaptation Funds Climate Innovation Accelerator and the Green Climate Funds Enhanced Direct Access Program and even the well-established Jeff Small Grants Program. And we also want to think about how these funders can better support LLA. And then finally, to wrap up, we really want to know what would be your key ask at COP26 for supporting LLA. In the first round of dialogues, as Eileen mentioned, there was a call for a minimum of 1 billion US per year from Ambassador Black Lane from the Alliance of Small Island States Oasis. But is this enough? When we had the second rounds of dialogue in Africa earlier this week, there was a call for 5 billion US a year to flow directly to regional, national, and subnational institutions. And what we want to hear from you today is, is this enough? And where should these funds go through? This will really help us to shape the ask for COP26 in Glasgow, which is just over two weeks away. So I think with that, I'll stop and say thank you very much. If you have any questions before we head into the breakout, please put them into the chat and we'll try to answer them and make sure everyone is clear about this before we head into the breakout discussion. Thank you, Anka. That was a really helpful presentation. Um, I thought the graphics were very helpful uh, and also very aspirational in terms of what business unusual can look like for adaptation. Um, and I really loved hearing about all those practical examples of funds that are at work today. As Eileen said, there is no longer any excuse um, but to support locally led adaptation. So that came through very, very clearly. I'm already learning so much from these presentations and we are right on time to move on to the next section. So with all of that fodder, we'll spend the next 45 minutes or so in breakout discussions, which will be a chance to discuss some of the questions that Ainka has just walked us through and reflect, on, um, and reflect on some answers together. So as Ayinka mentioned, we'll be asking ourselves what is required for progress on LLA, how international climate finance can support, and of course, Claire asks for COP as the adaptation community. So you'll be randomly placed into groups now. Again, if you want to be allocated to a Spanish speaking breakout room, please mark or put ES at the end of your Zoom name so those working behind the scenes can help make that happen. So right now we should all be transported to our, um, to our various uh, Zoom groups. They will all be, we'll all be looking at the same questions. Um, and after that, we will regroup to hear back from, from the teams. Great, looks like we have most people back um, and some may have had to drop off, of course. It's a, it's a long session this evening or this, this afternoon, depending on where you're calling in from. Okay, I don't see the numbers changing anymore, so let's go ahead and, and, and get started. Well, I hope that you all enjoyed your sessions as thoroughly as I enjoyed mine. I really appreciated that time that wasn't rushed um, to really explore those questions together. And my group had some really great ideas that came out of the conversation, actually. So I'm looking forward to seeing what other groups had to say. So right now, we're moving into our report back session. Uh, and this will be the last thing that we do before we close out. And the way that we're going to do this is um, for each group, there should be a, a nominee, someone who will, who will um, provide uh, the report back on behalf of their group. And we're going to pose questions to each of the groups 
to help pull out um, those insights. So I would ask, this report back is not sort of a summary, so no need to cover everything that was discussed. Of course, you have members of the organizing team in each of the groups that were taking notes. Rather, the point here is to really synthesize some of the key topics that were discussed. Um, and so please, you know, focus on being additive to comments that might have come before you um, as we're going through this report out period. So let's begin. I want to ask a question first to groups. Probably let me just start with groups one and two. Um, and in the question, in the in the in the breakout sessions, we had um, talked about changes that are needed at at different levels, at the national level, and so on. So for group one, um, I'd like to understand what is one change needed for national government systems to support locally led adaptation better that stood out from your group's discussion. So group one, if you could tell us a little bit about what your group discussed on national government systems and how they can better support locally led adaptation. I was wondering which one is the group one. I have a Mario that he will be um, doing the, the, the recap. And we took some notes. I'm going to share just to Mario to, um, to follow some of the main issues. Adelante, Mario. Hola, solo que no reconocí la primera pregunta cuando le dijeron, porque, bueno. Eh, ¿Qué tal? Eh, la pregunta que nosotros subimos eh, fue ¿Cuáles son los factores que facilitan la escalada de la adaptación dirigida localmente? En la discusión eh, charlamos un poco sobre la necesidad del fortalecimiento de las redes locales, el intercambio de experiencias, enseñando prácticas que desarrollan las comunidades, mayor investigación y diagnóstico, estudios de caso, eh, mayor... Eh, inclusión de los grupos sociales, las políticas de Estado, eh, destacar justamente las actividades que muchos colectivos, grupos de mujeres tienen eh, iniciativas, se pusieron ejemplos como en el corredor seco de Brasil, donde el cambio, el cambio climático llega antes que en otras regiones, se habló también de eh, los... Eh, Los, los, los ejemplos en la zona costera, en Uruguay, eh, se habló sobre la necesidad de tomar en cuenta la diversidad ecológica y cultural de los, de, de los territorios, el contexto socioeconómico y territorial que genera las diferentes oportunidades y, y todo esto eh, para ayudar incluso en, en, con el tema de, del financiamiento y la comunicación entre, entre los actores. No sé si paso a la siguiente pregunta. That's, that's good for now. That helps us answer. I think we, we got your um, thoughts on uh, the specific um, support needed from national governments in terms of inclusion of social groups and supporting on local networks. So I'll come back to group one to answer, to answer some other questions in a bit. Thank you so much for that. Group two, I believe, which was uh, moderated by Steph. Um, mm -hmm. If you could come on and, and answer the same question for us. I want to stay on the topic of the national mm -hmm. government systems. Um, what were a couple of changes uh, from the national government system specifically that your group discussed? Mm -hmm. Well, we had a, a very diverse and just excellent breakout session. Almost everyone participated. Uh, a lot of themes and, and insights were, were shared, but two that I can bring out to answer this, this question are first, this, this topic and issue of improving the way we communicate about climate adaptation and locally led adaptation. This is a theme that just kept coming up again and again. And for all the questions really, to, that we really need uh, governments and people representing local groups to emphasize the human face of the effects of climate change, to go beyond talking about finance and dollar amounts and, and to, really, to really bring it back to the values and the, the human side of, of climate change and the people who are severely threatened and endangered by climate impacts. And, and for this, it's really essential to bring in 
local actors and to have them be the ones who are sharing and communicating uh, what is happening, the great work and measures that they're already implementing instead of having, for example, consultants kind of representing these things on, on their behalf. So that is, that is one, the communication and really putting people and local actors at the center. Another uh, theme that came up in, that is relevant to this question is involvement of the private sector. So it's really critical that governments and other actors understand the language of the private sector and are able to bring them into these conversations, into forums, and um, where they feel like they, they fit in and that they're part of the solution and that they have a, a role to play when it comes to that climate adaptation. So these are just two of the things that I would like to share right now and I'll let the other groups go next. Thank you, Stephanie. Great. So we're gonna come back to some of that in a bit. I wanna to get to the other groups. Um, group three, which I believe was, um, was moderated by Anka. Uh, well, let's move on to the international climate finance space, which was kind of what question two was about. Um, and let's hear from your group, Anka, what stood out as one change that's really needed for the international climate finance community to support LLA? Uh, so thanks for that, uh, Rebecca. I think um, I will be presenting because I didn't have any takers to present on behalf of the group. Um, so we talked about a number of things, but one of the first things we talked about is for those that are actually applying directly to some of these climate funds, it would be nice to really have them think about how to streamline and make their application processes much less onerous. You know, not having separate very different types of, you know, applications that require different types of things. Uh, you know, if everything was actually quite similar, even one application process, which is probably very hopeful, you know, it could just make it so much simpler in order to easily apply for these funds and not have to relearn different systems for every different fund, um, when a lot of the times they're asking for similar types of things. Um, a second thing we talked about is really thinking about the criteria and indicators that are being used to actually both evaluate proposals, but once proposals and projects are approved, evaluating what's the actual impact on the ground in terms of both process and outcomes. And so, for example, in evaluating proposals, uh, we had a group, the Pawanka Fund was represented in our breakout group, and they were talking about the fact that we think about environmental and social safeguards, but don't necessarily think about other things like cultural indicators and other things that really should be considered when looking at a proposal and not just the technical content. And I think the same goes for measuring success. You know, if we only thinking about getting lots of funds out of the door and that's your measure of success, that's you know, really just capturing one aspect of it. What's the actual quality of change that's happening on the ground? Are we actually addressing structural inequalities? Are we actually building local resilience? So those are some of the things that we discussed in terms of changes we would like to see from international climate finance community. Thank you, Ayinka, super succinct um, on streamlining the process and on measures of success and indicators. That really harks back to what we spoke about in dialogue one. So that, that's really excellent. Group four, I'm going to ask the same question of you. That was Marek's group. Um, and if you, we could stay on the topic of the international climate finance space and what's needed to support LLA. Marek. Thanks, Rebecca. So yeah. Um... I'm also reporting back for our group, some fantastic discussion, and hopefully we'll have a little bit more time to go over some of those, build on some of those fantastic report backs on the first question. Um, um, and some of those ideas, I guess, building on our anchors, we really had, I guess, a real strong call to recognize that those at the front line of climate change, those that most need the funding that is being pledged from climate financiers are, uh, the ones that actually have the least time to spend accessing these funding. So we need international actors to really think about what is it required for local actors to really access this funding and make sure this access criteria is really tailored for their needs. And we really need to recognize that this whole process is an, a learning by doing process and adaptation is going to be here for the next 
10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years. It's not just a project for four years or even less. We need the funding to be recognized that we need adaptation to be taking place consistently over time. And therefore it needs to be, it needs to be programmatic. It needs to be working with facilitators who can mobilize local communities. And therefore it needs to be accompanied by the right institutions to make that happen. It's a two-way process. And therefore going back to, I guess, a final point, is really we need donors to be asking local actors, what is it that we need to be doing to reform and change? We need them to work with local institutions and say, how do we need to change our processes and our access criteria to really work for local led adaptation? Yeah, I think that covers it probably. Um, but my group, please do pop stuff in the chat if I've missed anything out. Thank you, Marek. That, that um, links to a lot of the things that were said in my group as well um, uh, around what do we need to do to change and, and thinking about what the, what the international climate finance community itself um, can be doing. Um, great. So, that, so we've covered the national level, we've covered the international level. I believe there were two more, um, two more groups in total. Um, so the next group, group five, which I think was Tamara, um, uh, let's move into now some questions around challenges. So, of course, we know that there are challenges to making some of these changes that, that have been discussed by the groups previously. I'm curious, did your group have any ideas on the how, how to address some of these challenges um, and con conditions that can support these changes? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks so much, Rebecca. And I'm, I'm also reporting, since I didn't have any volunteers from my group, but... but um, but yeah, we had some really great ideas. So likewise, um, would like to invite members of my group to, to pop in additional thoughts into the chat. Um, I think one, one challenge and solution um, that came out and that came across um, most of the questions actually that we discussed was the, you know, the challenge of lack of local input and sort of accountability for actually using that input and making sure that that input from local partners is actually taken into account and informing decisions um, as the challenge. And, and one idea that came out was sort of having, having oversight committees or, or having different sort of steering committees um, that would bring in uh, representatives from, from local partners um, to kind of help provide that oversight, provide input. So having kind of form, formal mechanisms like a, like a committee um, that would ensure um, that that representation and that input from local partners actually kind of gets applied and as informing relevant decisions. And we talked about this uh, in the context of both sort of national level processes, but then also um, thinking ahead to, to how it could be applied um, to international as well. That's a great idea, taking note of that. And I want to ask the same question of group six, which was Ebony and Claire. That was my group, <laughs> Ebony and Claire. Um, uh, what were some of the, the things that we discussed as, and our group did have quite a number of these uh, ideas for actually solving some of these challenges we're, we're talking about? Yeah, um, well, I'll have them go first and then um, Ebony, you jump in if I've um, missed out one of the critical points. Um, so um, there was there was thought around how to get access to be easier um, through using uh, really focusing on the, the countries and, and communities within those countries that are experiencing the greatest shock and then work with the, in those locations with those people to develop um, bankable projects. Um, and a recognition that data requirements are challenging, but actually that's part of what needs to be funded. Um, and one of the ideas that uh, came out earlier that's very relevant is around developing comprehensive nationwide plans. So if each country was being supported to develop that countrywide plan, then um, the donors would be in a situation where they're being that they're, they, they are required in some ways to, to really back those plans and to work with them and, and build the um, build the capabilities um, around those plans. Um, there was also a couple of points around representation that I think is just worth thinking about briefly. That um, you know that local voices are really critical to um, bringing those alternative solutions to the forefront at the national level, regional level, and the international level. 
for that process of representation needs funding. So um, we need the donors actually to be stepping up on funding that representative rep representation so that it's effective. Um, and that would that would perhaps go some way to um, uh, donors also beginning to understand those local partners and begin to take risks because they you know when they've got good representation, there's um you can begin to build trust um, at the different levels. Um, so that's me trying to collect a few ideas into a couple of points, but um, Ebony, please. No, I mean, Claire, that was absolutely perfect. I was going to mention the point around um, risk taking and really imploring um, greater risk taking effectively. And that's kind of in both directions. That's including decision makers taking risks by engaging closer with local communities, but also there were some good points around local communities needing to take risks themselves by, for example, WhatsApping your finance minister about these issues, which was a fantastic idea. Um, and then Claire, you've already mentioned that um, there was a really good ask around uh, encouraging a seat at the table for CSOs to be involved in these decision-making processes. There was an example that was given that could be a, a bit of a standard, I guess, in that um, the Jeff through their small grants program in Jamaica was sort of funding people to attend um, meetings and uh, conferences, I think, and that helped to bring those voices into those forums. So that could be an example of where um, similar asks could be made. But otherwise, it was a great recap, Claire. Nothing, nothing further from me. What I liked about that conversation was the asks don't have to be these humongous things, right? This is such a practical ask um, and something that can be actioned on um, almost immediately. So I, I really appreciated that that component of the of the conversation. Right. I think I've gotten through all the groups with with round one. And we have um, the uh, second half of our 40 minutes. So I'm gonna do a, a second round of questions. So I'm coming back to group one. I believe that was Mario was speaking for group one. Um, and I wanted to ask um, if your group got to particular asks for, for locally led adaptation at COP26, what were some of the specific asks that you guys came up with? Um. <laughs> Hay un pedido especial y se charló con respecto a la posición de, de varios países, por ejemplo, Nicaragua eh, es, ha, ha preparado un documento eh, para que solicitar um, de la COP de que Centroamérica y la región del Caribe sea considerada este, como una región altamente vulnerable al cambio climático y eso para apoyar a y facilitar el flujo de financiamiento y, y, y no solamente es la, la posición de Nicaragua y Centroamérica, sino que también en el caso de Uruguay existe el hecho de que se ha de, demostrado de que es un país que está más afectado por las condiciones globales del cambio climático que de la, de la propia condición misma de lo que produce el país. Entonces, eh, definitivamente esa es una, una, una posición de, de reconocimiento a, a, de las que se están hablando que se van a solicitar. Eh, a la vez, eh, se pide la, la, facilitar el acceso al financiamiento para las comunidades más vulnerables Eh, ver justamente un, una promoción para el cambio de producción local para potenciar los alimentos de las regiones, o sea, menos los industrializados y más los de la producción natural. Eh, y creo que nada más, este, todas las notas resumen eh, un poco esa, esa petición. No sé si quieres, quieres agregar algo, Eli. No, creo que está completo. Gracias, Mario. Thank you so much, Mario. Thanks, Eileen. Um, I'm going to turn back to group two now, which was Steph. Again, same question. If you can tell us what were some of the specific asks and ideas for COP26 that came out of your group. Well, similar to what Mario said, uh, facilitating access to finance that came up in our group a few times. And just that there are too many levels, too many hoops, and it's just a very unclear pathway sometimes to the finance. Uh, someone said, for example, that the GCF only has three projects per country in the Caribbean, which is nowhere near enough.
for the level of vulnerability that the, the region faces. Uh, there is also an ask for um, a change in how mechanisms are, are existing right now, one in which uh, people who are at the forefront of climate impacts are the ones who have a more decision-making role. So it came up that academics, researchers, indigenous peoples in particular are being left out of these, these decision-making um, scenarios. And let me see if there was one other. Oh, another one was this, again, this issue of, of communication across sectors and having more clarity on policies, agreements, what countries are actually doing and also how the, the private sector and private companies can contribute. Thank you for that, Steph. Great. So now let me move on to group three, which was Ainka's group. Um, Ainka, did you did your group have any particular thoughts on enablers? Um, so that 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 meaning um, the challenge uh, solutions uh, to address some of the challenges that we've been talking about uh, throughout the session now, whether that's at the national level or the international level. Um, so in terms of the enablers, um, I think many of the enablers that we identified were ones that were um, at least discussed previously when we went through the first round, but we did have a nice discussion around some of the specific enablers for civil society led mechanisms. Um, and I think one of the things people noted is that there's still some sort of uh, lack of real awareness around what's really working on the ground and what's not. And it would be very helpful to have better documentation and sharing of what is working in terms of locally led adaptation, which I think is nice to hear given the work that the global consortium that's working on LLA is trying to capture these different examples of innovative models and really document and share them so people have examples of work that can be scaled up and replicated. Um, and so I think that was one of the key things and that linked in really to a point around sort of better monitoring and evaluation and learning to really feed back into the sort of decision-making and planning that's happening around adaptation. And another key point was also around really supporting capacity building. So not just thinking about strengthening organizations and institutions, which is obviously really key. You have to have strong CSOs and other types of local actors to really deliver effective adaptation, but also thinking about the technical capacity, which is linked to that point about not being aware of what's working well. You know, and so building up technical capacity and they're providing funding that's really sort of supporting that capacity building and that tech technical assistance to really be able to understand the issues and effectively address them. Because you don't want to make the problem worse. You want to really understand what you should be doing and drawing on the best available science, as well as local and indigenous knowledge and solutions that exist. So those were some of the key things that were highlighted and people felt that peer-to-peer -peer learning and support is actually quite a powerful tool for supporting some of that capacity building as well. Um, whether it's peer-to-peer -peer for CSOs, but also peer-to-peer -peer for governments and private sector um, in terms of building on what other people have been doing successfully. So I think I'll end there. Thanks Brilliant. for that. Brilliant. And then any unique asks for COP that came out of your group? Um, in terms of unique asks, um, I think we jumped, um, we didn't really jump, we had a bit of a discussion and then we kind of went to that sort of big question of is the 1 billion per year enough and you know, is that something that we could reasonably ask for um, and I think the, the feeling was that it probably isn't enough, although people were like we need to do some research, we're not even sure exactly how much is you know, being asked for, what's the gap specific to locally led adaptation. And I think there is a bit of pessimism, um, which is probably kind of important to share in terms of the realism 
of it is that you know people kind of noted that they were not anywhere close to getting to the hundred billion per year ask in you know in reality. And so you know, with any pledges to say that we're going to get one billion or even five billion per year really kind of translates to actual financing on the ground. Um, and so you know, but there's still the, the idea that there is, should be an ask, and I guess that the one billion or five billion may not actually even be enough if we really want to address these issues. Yeah. So that was it for my group. Please feel free to share anything in the chat if I missed anything uh, for the rest of my group members. Yes, please feel free to drop things into the chat. All of the information, all of the comments are being collected. Marek, I'm coming back to you to ask a, a similar question around enablers and so wanting to get not just um, perspective on the challenges, but some solutions. So any solutions, any enablers that came out of your group chat on the on the challenges that we've been discussing? Yeah, a few enablers, um, quite a few in putting across the board. So I guess for civil society, we need to put policy in place that really recognizes and includes those that have previously been excluded from decision making, not just that sees them as vulnerable groups, but sees them as solution holders, as those who um, are the ones that have the experience and the knowledge to address adaptation from the civil society side. So actually recognizes that within policy, that they're the ones who hold a significant amount of the knowledge. From the private sector, it was mentioned that obviously we have an ongoing movement on corporate with social responsibility, but moving into environmental and social governance issues, and that provides an opportunity with a growing calls for regulation on the private sector um, to integrate local led adaptation, I guess, a growing call for business to understand how do they use that. And this is an opportunity to uh, an enabler to really support that, those are that move for regulation, that strong regulatory call within the private sector. Um, and from the international climate finance space, uh, we didn't have a specific ask to COP, and I really, I guess, just building on our anchor's point, I really, I like that realism of it. How do we even get to know um, what the ask it really is? Um, and I think that's really, really a great point. And we know probably the hundred billion is it's not even sufficient. It provides fantastic for solidarity, but um, is that really enough when we have trillions in capital markets flowing that are doing bad stuff, let alone the hundred that's meant to be doing some good stuff? So I think that's a really, really great to have a sense of realism on that. And I guess maybe just to on the international space. Really, we need to also be delivering, I guess, a democratization of climate finance. It can't just go to national governments. It also needs to go to other sectors of society to support innovation, redundancy and adaptation to support more um, grassroots led approaches. So I guess that um, there's many more fantastic ideas that emerge. But I guess hopefully that summarizes it in our group. And again, yes, my group, please do pop in the chat. Um, if I've missed anything or, you, or you've come up with it in the space, a, a fantastic ask to add. Great, we've just got uh, uh, our last 10 minutes or a quarter of the time left. So we're, we're doing very well on time. I'm going to move into groups uh, five and six, um, which would be back to Tamara uh, to ask uh, you know, questions. We, we touched a bit on international finance at the at the top, and I want to come back to that. Um, Tamara, I might have asked you this. Have, was would did I ask you already about international climate finance? Perhaps I'll flip it around and ask you about the national this time. And see Sorry, if you have yeah, any we thoughts to on yes. So your what your group talked about in terms of the national um, uh, national challenges uh, and changes that are needed at the national government level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we, we talked about the, the challenges last time as well. I mean, I think, you know, we talked about, um, you know, things that come up often when we talk about, um, when we talk about what's needed for local education in terms of simplified processes, um, simplified reporting and access um, to, to finance. I think one thing maybe that I'll highlight um, just uh, that came out of our group. So, um, you know, to avoid summarizing all of the great ideas that, that came out. But one thing we did focus on was the importance of traditional and local knowledge. I see in the chat that, that this um, was a theme that was discussed in a lot of groups. Um, but we, we talked about sort of, um, you know, 
on the one hand, um, the importance of, of education and capacity building, but on the other hand, sort of recognizing that um, the, the importance and value of local expertise and the role that traditional knowledge can play. Um, and, and not just recognizing it, but maybe thinking about some more formal mechanisms for bringing in traditional knowledge. So how we might uh, uh, update or, or revise some of the planning, um, planning and decision-making processes so that they're, um, that they are not just uh, informed by kind of scientific knowledge, but that, that we also are really intentionally bringing in um, traditional knowledge and um, I know other groups mentioned this as well, but, but that also kind of touching on some of the cultural um, competencies and, and pieces there um, and recognizing the, those factors as well. So, um, so recognizing kind of the, the value that those can bring to adaptation planning processes and, and having some more um, formal mechanisms for, for actually making sure that, that those, um, that expertise and that information gets, gets brought in to inform decisions. Brilliant, thank you. And just before we close, any, any other asks for COP that came out of your group tomorrow? Or have we covered everything so far? Yeah, you know, we, we had a really rich discussion on questions one and two. <laughs> we spent a little bit less time on, on question three. So maybe members of my group have, now that they've had some time to think about it, they might um, have some ideas that they can um, pop in the chat, but we did sort of cover, you know, the, the big picture of the need for more adaptation financing and more kind of, um, you know, compared with mitigation financing, especially with regard to SIDS. Um, and, and we also talked about kind of some of these similar ideas of, of um, what it could look like to, to have um, sort of revise some, some planning processes to, um, to make sure that representatives of local groups are included um, and maybe have more frequent um, revision of, of plans um, to make sure that we're including these key factors for supporting LLA. Brilliant, okay. So last but not least, Claire and Ebony, I'm gonna come back to you um, to see if you have, I mean, we've covered so much now with this, with this um, synthesis and this report back, but were there any final ideas that came out of our group on the national governance, on the national government level or the international climate finance level in terms of changes that are needed to support LLE? Um, I'll, I'll um, try, and, try and bring in, I've tried to summarize some of those points earlier, but to emphasize, I think, uh, the need for comprehensive national level plans, thinking about how to intervene across all the vulnerable communities in a country. Um, the, the need to recognize um, those uh, civil society actors who can bring together that local knowledge and, and inform the development of those plans and really build on um, community, local, indigenous understandings of where the risks are and why and how to, how to prepare for them, how to reduce that risk. There was, a, there was a huge emphasis within our discussions around the international level, around the importance of patient and flexible support. And I think um, we've heard that again and again, and indeed it has its own principle as a result, that um, until um, that flexibility is there, it's impossible to do the adjustment and, and shifting of approaches that one needs to when you're working at that local level, bringing together different actors in different ways to really work to people's um, strengths. But the, the the third point that I'd like to make was one which I really think we should possibly make one of our top asks of the COP was um, to put representatives of LDCs and small island developing states in the funds that are that are providing climate finance, so they're more understanding of actually the limits and the and the um, the challenges that are faced by these very capable but very small governments when you've only got a few staff in a department in one uh, nation compared to you know, many um, tens of people in another nation, it's, there's obviously different ability to respond to all these requirements from these funds. So we need to get um, those uh, who actually understand the challenges for the LDCs and for the SIDS um, as part of the delivery of, of getting finance out the door and to these, to these locations. Um, I don't know if you've got anything to add um, there, um, Ebony, or whether we finish on that one. It's a perfect time to finish on, Claire. Thanks. 
Really I would agree. Perfect. Excellent. Great. And for any of the six of you or anyone else on who was part of the conversation with this synthesis and summary, have we captured the breadth of everything that was discussed? Are there any last ideas that haven't yet been represented? I would like to chip in for uh, uh, 10 seconds, okay? <clears throat> uh, Rebecca, thank you. I have an idea in, in our group, communication, education, indigenous knowledge, so many things came. I have a simple suggestion to make. When you look at COP26, aiming for a, a more and more involvement financially and otherwise, it's worthwhile to think reverse. That is 100 plus LLA, locally led, you know, initiatives should go back to the concerned people in their own languages, which will greatly help in networking the local, you know, stakeholders, enablers, financial, private, and everybody. And it costs nothing to bring back these best practices back home. Please take it seriously so that it's going to help in a big way. Um, this is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Jagannatha. Um, we really appreciate it. Wonderful. Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I think just to summarize some of the points that I'm hearing, and we have we have note takers in the background um, taking all of these notes, and we'll 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 compile all of this. But I think um, some things are coming out clearly. I think it, it's sounding like there's a lot that the international climate finance space can be doing to further streamline the process. Um, far less create more availability of funds, but what, what came up clearly was the need to streamline the process. This came up clearly in dialogue one and to have more meaningful measures of success. So what does it mean to, to be supporting a locally led adaptation and, and, and how do you, what are the indicators? Um, some, some very clear hows came, came out. Um, so, so the idea from tomorrow's group around the oversight committees um, to ensure input from local communities the idea to send more local people to, um, to the major forums like COP and so on to support that effort. Um, <clears throat> and of course, there was uh, the conversation around hiring more local people into the finance organizations, the finance institutions, um, having people from the region actually running the programs. And so thinking about one, one, one quote I liked from today was, the changes needed not just at our level, but at their level too. That's what I heard someone say. And so I think we, we've, we've rounded out to a number of ways in which the, the climate um, finance space itself could be changing um, to support locally led adaptation. We moved into the national level then after that. Um, and what I found really interesting from these conversations is you could see from all the perspectives that have been raised is that there's actually a very clear um, area where government and state level institutions are actually quite important. So we heard Claire talking about the idea around the comprehensive planning. Um, this came out again from our group and we were talking about um, someone what someone made the, the given example of green affordable housing plans going on in St. Lucia and moving people from low lying areas to higher to higher ground, um, and but but you know building in 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 hilly areas and 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 high grounds can have very, very disastrous uh, effects in terms of runoff and flooding. And so you can see immediately where in order to do something like that, a, a centralized planner would be required, but of course, drawing from and, and informed by um, local perspectives. Um, we talked about better coordination, better communication um, around and between groups um, linking national strategies directly to actions that are happening at the local level. All of that is what would actually be you know, required by, by national governments. We also spoke a bit about the need to communicate better um, and more clearly, to document first of all, and then to communicate more clearly what's actually happening at the local level, to put, um, to, to capture examples that can be scaled up and to communicate loudly and clearly about those examples. All of these are areas where the national government um, and state-led actors can actually have a role to play. So the, so the, the, the conversation is not so much government step aside um, and let locally led, um, let local communities do their thing, but really here's how to fall in place. And you can almost see sort of a clear action agenda for governments um, to support locally led adaptation coming out of the conversation. So that was brilliant. 
And then finally, the asks specifically um, for for COP. I think we we're 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 all, of course, you know, talking about the commitment. Is the hundred billion per year enough? Clearly, um, clearly not. As as Marek was making that comparison to where where funding uh, and investment is globally right now. Um, how do we understand what is the gap? Um, we we that that brought that brought us to the point on data. Um, and the fact that we that data and information services are are a crucial missing um, missing gap or missing space in in all of this conversation. As a researcher myself, I'm I'm fully behind that. A brilliant article was posted in the in uh, by Carbon Brief um, just a few days ago, which looked at the top 100 papers uh, in the uh, top 100 most influential papers in the climate in the climate space, uh, capturing about 1,300 authors. Over 75% of those authors are from the global north. So the global south, all of the global south is representing some 25% of our climate scientists. I think about 1% of that was from Africa. So, so data and information um, and uh, you know, support for, for the sciences, support from, for knowledge creation in the global south, hugely important. Democratization of that finance, um, also important. So these are some of the key highlights um, that, that came out of our conversation. Also that we need to recognize, uh, recognize uh, the community groups that are engaged in all of this work. Uh, one, one final thing that came, up, came across was that they're actually, uh, the legislation speaks to uh, locally led groups oftentimes, but then for some reason, they're not on the radar. Um, and they're not being recognized. Their work is not being documented. So they need to recognize groups um, came out clearly. So need for more finance uh, in terms of quantity, um, need to ensure that the finance is high quality to reach and support partners, which means simplifying the processes, simplifying the re reporting, being more patient, more flexible, um, and themes of course around, um, you know, uh, the importance of integrating local traditional knowledge, recognizing cultural factors and so on. So these are just some of the, of the uh, ideas that, that came out uh, from the conversations. Really, really brilliant and very rich conversation. I want to thank everyone for sticking with us thus far. We have almost everyone that was there at the beginning of the call still here two hours plus later, almost two and a half hours later. So thank you all for that. And thank you so much for participating and helping us to advance this important conversation. So we're going to do one last chat shower to close us out, asking the same question, what would be your one ask for locally led adaptation at COP? You can see it here on the, on, the, um, on the screen. What would be your one ask for LLA at COP? Let's see if your thoughts have changed at all, um, given everything that we've learned today. So type your answers. At least 1% of climate finance for indigenous people specifically. Defined metrics. Simple adaptation financing, easier access to funding, bottom-up strategies, improving the narrative, demonstration of real examples of how this is operating, how it's functioning, and raising more, uh, raising more available funding mechanisms for communities. Wonderful. Well, that is all um, incorporating bottom-up approaches. All of the answers are coming through. Um, and it's all very much aligned with, with what we've talked about. So I think we're all, we're all landing on the same page and speaking with a common voice here. Help for cooperatives, simple processes. That comes across very, very clearly from dialogue one and dialogue two as a major need. Great. Well, uh, we hope that you've enjoyed today's session. We hope that you continue to stay involved in the discussion in the lead up to COP26 and beyond. Um, there's a couple of ways that you can do this. Of course, you or your institution can endorse the principles for locally led adaptation and join the locally led adaptation community of practice. How to do that? Well, endorsing the principles is pretty easy. We have a short form, which we will share the link to in the chat, and we can include your logo uh in the communications materials we just ask that you share what you're learning on your locally led adaptation journey through the community of practice so i believe someone should share that link in a second into the chat you can also stay involved by participating in one of the many locally led events that are happening at cop 26 
for those of you who, who will be there, um, including through the Resilience Hub and the Locally Led Adaptation Hub. Well, with that, let me thank you all tremendously for your time, for your thoughts, for your perspectives. We hope that you each took something away new from this conversation as well. Even though you're all the experts, we hope that you're able to learn something from your peers through this dialoguing. The team is behind the scenes, as I mentioned, collecting all of this valuable insight for its outputs, and we will surely be in touch on those in the very near future. It was my pleasure to facilitate this rich conversation. So from me, from WRI, from our partners, we want to thank you so much and please have a good day from whatever part of the globe you're calling in from. Tamara and Marek, let me pass it back over to you to see if there are any closing remarks or logistics you'd like to take care of. Thank, thanks so much, Rebecca. Uh, if you could just go back to the previous or the slide with the four events. But firstly, just thank you so much for attending this session. It's been fantastic. And this has been the final one in our dialogue and it's all been absolutely fantastic. Um, so thank you to all the facilitators of the groups, Rebecca for moderating, uh, Ayanka and Eileen for presenting. So just one final note, if you are going to be at COP, uh, there are a number of events which we've got on the screen here that are going to continue this local led adaptation dialogue that we've been having. Um, on Monday the 8th, Voices from the Frontline, hosted by the COP26 Presidency, will hear from some of those that have been involved in these dialogue series, and we hope to re-strengthen this call to action for more local-led adaptation. And the Resilience Hub and the LLA Hub itself, that will be really supporting discussions and small talks on local-led adaptation, we hope to see you there. There will be numerous sessions continuing these discussions over, over both of those um, spaces. And Development and Climate Days is a way to engage virtually. There will be fully virtual sessions, and if you can't be at COP, they will be fully virtual, which will have a session on financing local-led adaptation in conflict and fragile states, and how to really get the private sector working for local-led adaptation. And one final note, the Resilience Hub will all be hybrid events. That means there will be physical and virtual engagement will be possible. Um, I think we'll pop in the chat again how to go and register for the Resilience Hub. So um, if you're not at the COP, don't worry, you can continue to be engaged. So thank you so much. And we hope to continue this discussion with you. And please do get in touch if you'd like to directly talk about this further. Thanks so much. Brilliant. Tamara, anything else from you before we close? No, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And thanks everyone for, for joining. I learned a lot and really appreciate everyone uh, joining this really rich discussion. Great. Well, with that, we are, we are officially closing the session. Thank you all so much. Uh, good day, take care, be safe, and we will all be in touch soon. Thank you.